The following program is in no way intended to replace your doctor's advice or treatment program, nor should it be used as a tool for the purpose of self-diagnosis. The footprint of diabetes is ubiquitously and disturbingly ubiquitous. According to World Health Organization, Dr. Sonia Nishta, representative. With regard to this whole issue of women in diabetes, we have a clip that we'd like to share. Well, uh, yeah, we can share the clip in a few minutes, but I just wanted to um, again say um, once a year, of course, the International Diabetes Federation uh, highlights um, uh, there's a day dedicated to um, diabetes and it's called World Diabetes Day, 14th of November. So, um, of course, this program is going to be repeated on several occasions. And you may be looking at this program after the 14th of November because we are actually um, pre-recording. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the studio is still waiting for some new equipment. So eventually we will come back live. So unfortunately, you will not be able to take live calls today. Um, so, uh, World Diabetes Day last year was on eyes, mm -hmm. and this year it's on uh, female or women's health care. Right. So, yes, there is a clip we want to um, show, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit about it. Yes, as yeah. you all know, women are the gatekeepers of healthy lifestyles in the home, uh, most homes. And so, we move on now to the clip on women in diabetes. So diabetes is a very serious women's health issue, isn't it? Yeah. That, that was a fantastic clip. You know, I only came across that clip uh, uh, yesterday or day before. So I think you were seeing that clip for the first time this morning. Mm -hmm. And um, we are using that in the first segment for uh, uh, medicine today um, because it's a topical issue. And I think the question is, as you looked at that clip, why do women 
not receive uh, the level of health care where diabetes is concerned as compared to men? Mm -hmm. that, that's, yes. that, that's one question. Um, and the, the statistics were that approximately 199 million women actually live with diabetes. Um, I wanted to point out to some of the um, issues that make women more vulnerable when they do succumb to diabetes. And um, one is, you know, the power dynamics in our society. Second one, you know, the ro gender rules. And thirdly, the socioeconomic inequalities that exist, especially in what we would call the two-thirds world, or some people call um, developing nations, um, where women are disadvantaged for those three reasons. And so access to health care for them and to knowledge or education about what healthy lifestyles and care mm -hmm. for um, diabetes victims uh, mm -hmm. involves is an issue. Yeah. So, so of course, you know, what we are used to as healthcare um, in the Western world, um, uh, Trinidad might be lagging behind in certain respects, but by and large, um, we have uh, equality of access to healthcare, but in some countries, um, women are really third class or second class citizens mm -hmm. and men are often given the health care because they're the breadwinners um, whereas typically in the western world women tend to access health care um, as a priority before men yes. so it's kind of turned around it, yes in, th in first world countries it has yes whereas in third world countries um, because of um, all the expectations that uh, very often women are devoting their lives to bringing up their children, um, looking after the household, etc. Um, they are not often treated as aggressively. And, and that, that's an important mm -hmm. thought. They are not treated as aggressively when they present with diabetes. Um, and of course, there's the other issue of gestational diabetes. Yes. Um, yeah, so women uh, who are pregnant, mm -hmm. um, can you just explore that a little bit? So, so we, we, we have two aspects of this. So we have women who are diabetics mm -hmm. who get pregnant. Mm -hmm. So that's type 1 or type 2 diabetes in pregnancy. But gestational diabetes is diabetes that develops in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. so, so that woman would not have been diabetic before the pregnancy. She gets into the pregnancy because of a strong family history. Mm -hmm. She may have had polycystic ovaries. Um, she might have been overweight. Um, she ha she's an increased risk. So now it's routine to screen all w women in pregnancy for diabetes at at least 24 weeks. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, uh, the, that's been controversial because the patient may have developed diabetes before. The thing about gestational diabetes, of course, is that it can be um, result in complications in the pregnancy. You have bigger babies. So it affects the babies when they're born as right? well. Right, so bigger babies, yeah. more difficult deliveries, mm -hmm. um, forceps deliveries, prolonged labor, and of course, increased caesarean sections. Right, which means that another generation is affected by... But, but of course, if, if, if a baby is born from a mother with gestational diabetes, mm -hmm. now I want to clarify this very carefully because yeah. a lot of parents come in and they have had diabetes in pregnancy, a mother, and she brings in her two or three year old and say, should we start checking that child for diabetes? Mm -hmm. Well, no, not at that age. What we are saying is that when those children grow um, to teenage or young adults, then their risk of diabetes escalates. Right. That links... Uh to something I read here about um, habits formed during adolescence in terms of diet, nutrition, and mm -hmm. physical activity yes. that do affect the um, period, the time period, or the onset of diabetes. Yes. Um, so, so, so th that's why th that term that women are the gatekeepers. Yeah. Um, we know, um, of course, rules are changing, but more or less in the Western, uh, in, in you, as you call it, the second. Second I, I call and third that, world? Th no, third world implies that you know, you're know you third on the list when actually um, the majority of, I call two. it the two-thirds world because two-thirds of the world are in that economic yes. um, situation, yes. socioeconomic situation. Um, and so to call it the third world when the majority of the world is, and two-thirds of the world are, right. is, are developed. Okay. So, so, so in that scenario, um, women are still... Um, 
um, a lot of them are working now, but, but a lot of, uh, of, of them are at home. Their primary role is still looking after the kids, mm -hmm. preparing meals, um, uh, taking kids to school, etc. So when we say they're the gatekeepers, um, if we target women, mm -hmm. uh, maybe we can target the next generation yes. in terms of healthy lifestyles. I just want to quote uh, Dr. Nishtar again. She says that um, premature deaths among adults are largely due to behavior initiated during adolescence. Um, which is where the potential of lifestyle modification is greatest. So if we catch them at adolescence with proper diet, proper nutrition, proper physical activity, um, you know, then we are actually uh, staving that onset yes. of diabetes yes. for a little, yeah. a little yeah. longer. And, ju and just one more point on this before we go to our first break, is that um, cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm. you know, typically uh, we expect men to present with heart disease in their 40s and 50s. But if a woman has diabetes, she has a three to four fold increased risk of mm -hmm. cardiovascular disease. And of course, you know, we have uh, one or two examples of um, one very good friend many years ago, just in her early 40s, um, who had diabetes and, mm -hmm. and died after bypass surgery. And you would have thought someone at 41 years old, sh a female, would not have significant coronary artery disease. So one of the things that the IDF is trying to highlight to doctors and healthcare professionals is if a woman presents us with diabetes in her 30s and 40s, don't, don't underplay or don't forget that, that they should be sent for cardiovascular screening as well. Okay. So World Diabetes Day, November the 14th, we normally wear blue, I think, on that day. Some yes. buildings, okay. uh, cities all over the city are lit in with the blue lights to commemorate that day. Um, and you're wearing your... Yes, little I circle. I the cameraman can get that, yeah. your, your diabetes circle. So at today to change tomorrow, that's the slogan for World Diabetes Day and of the International Diabetes Federation. Um, we return in a few minutes uh, with some more on the serious women's issue of diabetes. Hi, I'm Reverend Valerie Ramkalawan from the Christ of Pro Revival Tabernacle. You can tune on every first and last Wednesday of the month on ACT and The Voice. And I'm there, 10.30 p.m. 15 minutes, you can tune on and you can be filled with the word of the Lord. Come on and be a part of this station. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Welcome to another edition of Scoreboard here on ACT and it's always a pleasure to be in your company every Tuesday evening between the hours of 8 and 9. Welcome to the new season of Football 101. I am your host Joshua DeMatos. Well, it's time for your weekly football news update. Hello, me, Messi. Unfortunately, uh, Max. Ki kiss the badge, kiss the badge. Oh, oh. What's that? Welcome to this edition of the interview and as you can see I'm not alone on the set I have 
Marcus, a Liverpool fan, and I have Shakira. Okay, so globally, more deaths are attributable to diabetes in women than in men. Um, today, we're looking at the whole issue of diabetes in, in women, but moving on now to something called the ticking clock. Yeah, um, hypothesis. Hy the ticking clock hypothesis. Right. Well, just before we dive into this, which is about complications of diabetes, um, we have a flyer that um, will come up. Um, just telling you a little bit about a seminar that we're going to have um, on Saturday, November the 11th. So again, if you're looking at this program after November the 11th, the seminar would have been finished. Um, so the flyer comes up and I'll just talk about it. Um, we have, in fact, three uh, female speakers. We have a podiatrist, we have an optometrist, I'm a diabetes educator, and this year we have a fitness expert. Mm -hmm. um, so the seminar, um, if we come off that flyer, the seminar um, is going to be held on Saturday, November the 11th um, at the Anaposis Chapel. That's the church location at number 12 Johnson Street from 4 to 6 p.m. It's going to be an excellent seminar. It's the last seminar we are having for the year. We have had about three or four and if you're interested, it's a free registration, 482-4269, 482-4269. Okay, so moving on quickly to this ticking clock hypothesis, okay. if you can So we, we can just bring up this um, first slide, oh. um, and uh, it's a clock, Yep. and it's ticking. <laughs> so what is that all about? Yeah, you tell us. <laughs> okay, we can come off the slide. And um, so, what's the, the, the uh, ticking clock hypothesis? Well, uh, the problem with diabetes is that it is a very deceptive illness. Mm -hmm. And I, I keep telling patients this all the time. You could have had diabetes for many years, and you have absolutely no complications of diabetes. You feel totally well. And, you know, just this week, I've had patients coming to me and uh, saying, well, you know, my blood sugar is high. The, the, the HbA1c is 10%, which means that the average blood sugar is running ob above 250. But, Doc, I feel okay. Well, the, th the ticking clock hypothesis says that the longer you leave your blood sugars high, you're putting your organs at risk. Mm -hmm. And we're going to come to the complications of diabetes in a minute. Um, and, and the sad thing is, if you develop complications of diabetes, eye complications, etc. And this is the other bit that patients find hard to understand, is that uh, they develop, for example, bleeding at the back of the eyes. We send them to the eye doctor, they treat it effectively, but, but, but the eyes still deteriorate. And they're saying to me, um, Dr. Khan, my blood sugars are well controlled, what's happening? Well, it's the ticking, the ticking clock hypothesis. Unfortunately, your body has a metabolic memory. Mm -hmm. and your body remembers that 10 years of poor control. Right. Okay, so what are some of the complications then of um, diabetes? We have, I know we have the macrovascular, yeah. we have the micro Okay, so you have, you have the macrovascular complications, mm -hmm. the microvascular complications, and then you have complications of diabetes. Mm -hmm. So let's start with macrovascular complications because um, I think we have shorter segments because we are um, playing another click, clip in a minute or two. Mm -hmm. um, in, in fact, um, let's just, be, before we look at this, um, let's just bring up the second clip that we have. It's about five minutes long, but it gives you a nice overview of the complications of diabetes. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name's John, and I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes some years ago. And I'm here to tell you my story and some things about type 2 diabetes you may not know. You've just seen the prevalence statistics for diabetes. We all know that this epidemic is having an overwhelming impact on society and healthcare spending worldwide. So 
Why is this often preventable, manageable illness causing such devastation? The answer lies in truly understanding how the whole body is affected by diabetes. The heart, blood vessels, brain, kidneys, liver, eyes, and nervous system. And that is why I'm here. The hormone insulin plays an important role in controlling blood glucose. Insulin allows sugar, glucose, to enter cells of the body from the bloodstream where it is used as energy, such as in muscle or brain cells, or stored, such as in liver or fat cells. Type 2 diabetes occurs when insufficient insulin is released or the body is unable to use insulin properly. This can lead to an insulin secretion deficiency or insulin resistance, which plays a key role in developing hyperglycemia or elevated blood glucose and eventually type 2 diabetes. As a result of hyperglycemia, glucose accumulates in the bloodstream, causing acute diabetic symptoms such as tiredness, blurred vision, thirst and frequent urination. But diabetes is also a chronic lifelong condition and thus requires careful control. Without proper management, damage may occur to widespread bodily functions. These are termed microvascular complications, which can affect the eyes, feet and kidneys, or macrovascular complications, which could affect the brain or the heart. Microvascular complications of diabetes can impair eyesight or cause vision loss. Excess blood sugar can cause nerve damage. Over time, high blood glucose levels damage the kidney filtering systems allowing protein into the urine, a condition called microalbuminuria. Longer term, excess glucose consumption progresses to a condition known as diabetic nephropathy. As a result of diabetes complications, in severe cases, patients can experience kidney failure requiring dialysis or transplantation. So, now that we've looked at the microvascular complications that can arise from diabetes, we'll turn our attention to the macrovascular complications. For example, atherosclerosis, which is a hardening and narrowing of the arteries caused by increased sugar in the bloodstream. When this happens in arteries supplying the heart, it can cause coronary heart disease, leading to heart attacks and angina. People with diabetes are two to four times more likely to have a heart attack than someone without the disease. In fact, adults being treated for diabetes are just as likely to have a heart attack or stroke or die from cardiovascular causes as people who have had a prior heart attack. Second, High levels of fats, such as cholesterol, in the bloodstream of diabetics further increase the risk of heart disease. In the brain, atherosclerosis can cause diabetes patients to suffer a stroke. The risk of stroke among people with type 2 diabetes is already high at the onset of the disease. In fact, it's more than double that of the general population. So you see, type 2 diabetes can affect our bodies dramatically. Every 10 seconds, two people develop diabetes and one person dies from diabetes-related causes around the world. Innovative therapeutic options for type 2 diabetes are critical 
to help prevent these serious long-term health consequences. I hope my story has brought you a bit closer to me, the patient. Goodbye, and I wish you the best of health. Right, well, so muscular, macrovascular, I know vascular has to do with veins. Right. Um, but what are macrovascular complications of diabetes? So I'm going to show two clips. The first, let's bring up the first um, slide here. Um, and that shows the heart. So macrovascular means um, the big blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, there's a clot forming in one of the major arteries of the heart. And um, very often, and, and I'm going to go on to the second slide. Um, so when we talk about macrovascular complications of diabetes, we are talking about ischemic heart disease, cerebral vascular disease, which is strokes, mm -hmm. and peripheral vascular disease. And that last paragraph there is very important. Diabetic patients have two to six times higher risk for development of these complications than the general population. Okay. So we can the just, reason we have to act today to change tomorrow. Absolutely. So, so for example, just yesterday I heard of a, uh, a patient who um, I've known for many years, and um, he was, he, he's been relatively well, just developed um, some chest pains, and I believe he went into his cardiologist, and he had about a 99% blockage of one of his major arteries. Thank God it was picked up in time and um, they were able to put in some stents and um, he's, he's resting at home comfortably now. But, but one of the things I just want to point out is that this was a silent process. Mm -hmm. He had no indication that this was going on. And I am now being much more, how should Sorry. I put it, aggressive. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I've always been thorough, yes, I would like to have. think. Yeah, um, but I'm being much more <laughs> aggressive in pushing my diabetic patients who are over 50 to go and have a stress test mm -hmm. um, uh, or an echo stress. Um, or if you can't exercise on a treadmill, you can have a dobutamine stress test. Mm -hmm. That's the first line investigation to look at your arteries. Um, because a normal resting ECG, and I, you know, we, we've talked about this before, just going to a doctor's office, lying on a couch, putting the leads on, will not tell you whether you have yeah. significant coronary artery disease. Yeah. And, and you know, the sad thing about this is that we can pick up on it at an early stage. Of course, the other thing that we showed was um, uh, strokes. Yes. And unfortunately, we, we are seeing people clogging up the arteries to the neck, um, those are the carotid arteries, mm -hmm. um, and they're developing strokes at a very early stage. And again, um, you know, we need to be much, much more aggressive um, in, in treating um, uh, the risk factors for stroke. So, so if you are a smoker mm -hmm. with diabetes, watch out. And I, you know, I just want to say to people who are looking at us tonight, if you, if you are um, if you have diabetes, you have high blood pressure, and you're smoking, you're, it's a time bomb. Right. So that's cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. That's strokes and hypertension. What's the, what's the third complication? Well, peripheral vascular disease, which is yeah. the arteries um, leading down to the leg. Mm -hmm. um, but I just wanted to, uh, this touches on both macrovascular and microvascular hypertension. Uh, I just wanted to bring this slide up. I'm not sure how... Um, Clearly, it's going to show um, mm -hmm. because some of it is in red. Um, right, it shows up sure. nicely. So, so, so we're talking about macrovascular disease. Why worry about hypertension mm -hmm. in diabetic patients? Because what this shows is that diabetes is not just about a blood sugar. And, and I really want to remind patients about that. Mm -hmm. Treating hypertension can reduce the risk of death by 32%. Microvascular disease, which we're going to come to, mm -hmm. by 37%. Yeah. Stroke by 44%. And heart failure by 56%. So, uh, you know, we can come off that slide. Yeah. Um, those are some... Serious statistics. Serious. Yeah. Now, Linda, the, the challenge here is patients 
can, you know, just yesterday, I had several patients, they come into the office and the blood pressure is skyrocketing. It's, it's mm -hmm. 180 over 90. And they would tell me that, uh, Doc, I just did my blood pressure in the car. I had a patient yesterday. Mm -hmm. He brought his blood pressure machine in because mm -hmm. he's been coming to me for several years now. And every time he comes in, his blood pressure is high. Yet at home, he continues to say his blood pressure is, is normal. And so just driving on these roads can raise your blood pressure. But, but, but he did his blood pressure in the car just outside, right. mm -hmm. and it was 133 over 67. Mm -hmm. He comes into my office, and the blood pressure is 177 over 88. Mm -hmm. um, is it something about my office? <laughs> no, I, I think my office is quite peaceful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have its, it's green so, color. It's, yeah. it's, it's not very clotted. Very restful color. Very, very yes. restful. So mm -hmm. what is happening? Well, it's what we used to call white coat hypertension. Mm -hmm. Now, is it happening, though, uh, the, the high blood pressure, only the doctor's office. Mm -hmm. Well, his wife happened to mention to me that he loses his temper very often. Oh, now, I don't right. know if it's because of his wife or because oh. of himself. Right? <laughs> That's self another issue. Yeah, self-control is a... Yeah, yeah, okay, that... yeah, it's a fruit of the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I think I'm going to be preaching about the fruit of the spirit on Sunday coming. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, so what I asked him is, so when you lose your temper mm -hmm. and you get angry, do you know what your blood pressure is going up to? Mm -hmm. So, so people may think, oh, it's just in the doctor's office. But as you're saying, driving on the roads. Yeah, just getting there might have been something that was stressful and, and raised his Right. Pressure. So how do we know whether we should... So what's a good blood pressure for a diabetic? You tell me. Do you want to guess? <laughs> yeah. 180. No, that's <laughs> quite high. A good blood pressure for a diabetic is about 140 over 80. Right. And, um, but there's a, there's, there's a um, proviso to that. Mm -hmm. If you have protein in the urine, mm -hmm. which is a marker for diabetic kidney disease, you really want to get that blood pressure even lower to 130 over 80. So there, there, there are two ways of knowing. Mm -hmm. Is this just an office effect? You can send a patient for ambulatory 24-hour blood pressure measurements. Mm -hmm. That's sending them to a cardiologist where they can put a little machine on and it measures the blood pressure every hour. Or you can do an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart. And if, if in fact, recently I did that on a patient and the left side of the heart was enlarged. Mm -hmm. So what I could tell that patient was, although you're telling me your blood pressure is normal at home, you need to be on a blood pressure medication. And that's the other issue, you know, you start the medication, you start to feel well, and then people stop, use, patients stop using the medication, or they decide that they're going to take it one day and not take it another. And we need the consistency of the readings. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you, well, Linda, you've hit on a very, very important point, compliance. Mm -hmm. We are fighting the battle, and I don't want to get in back into the herbal story, but we are fighting the quacks out there who claim to be doctors and are not. Um, in fact, we saw, I don't know if we have to go to a break. Do we, do, 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 I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, I don't think we have to go to a break yet. Um, I'm trying to see my peripheral vision, but I think then, women, women have yeah. better peripheral vision than men. Um, did you see a clip about that, people putting their foot in water? A foot spa, a foot spa. You tell um, us about that, Linda. What uh, well, was that about? Um, basically, the water was being colored to um, encourage patients to think that the... Um, the quantity of the tint indicated certain uh, illnesses within the body, um, and uh, it turned out to be quackery. But Thank they were you. using it in, in, in spas. So, yes. so, so, you know, I know sometimes you think I'm a little bit outspoken, and, and I have mentioned that before, mm -hmm. and, and uh, there, there are people, I mean, it's a widespread practice in this country. I am going to say very, very strongly, Patients, people who are listening to me tonight, stop going to people who are doing this pseudo medicine, who are put, making you put your feet in water, you think you're being detoxed. Ask them what they're sprinkling in the water mm -hmm. before. And, and this was an underground investigation, and it was shown very clearly that what is being sprinkled in the water helps the water turn. Yeah, to that the color. Shades, yeah, the different right. shades. Of and, and it has no detoxifying mystical effects. Yes. So we looked at some of the macro 
um, vascular complications. Let's have a look at some of the microvascular right. ones. I, I, we may have to go to a break in a, in a few minutes, but uh, we, we talked about hypertension mm -hmm. with macrovascular, mm -hmm. but of course cholesterol. Yes, it's and, and I didn't have a chance to talk about that. Um, and, and again, what I want to say to patients is that if you're in your 40s, um, and you've never had your cholesterol checked, you, you, you really need to do a full lipid profile because very often, uh, you know, we have continued to see on the show, your total cholesterol might be normal, but your triglycerides are high, your HDL, which is your good cholesterol, is low, and your LDL might be slightly high, but there's another particle called the VLDL. Oh, that's a new one. That's the very low density lipoprotein. Mm -hmm. And very often in diabetics, the triglycerides are high and the VLDL is high. And what that means is that the LDL particles, which is the toxic particles also, are very, very atherogenic. They stick to the walls of the artery. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, Linda, you know, the whole question is, should we be aggressive putting people on cholesterol tablets? And I know you have some concerns about... Well, yeah, I mean, I've, I've put myself on... Uh, have um, you? <laughs> and uh, I, I do feel some of the side effects, like cramps um, okay. in the legs and uh, difficult muscular, muscular issues. Right, yeah. okay. So, so there are some side effects to the statins. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, you know, one of the things I would say is that you might tolerate one statin, so you might um, not tolerate... Cresto, for example, mm -hmm. but you may tolerate Lipitor mm -hmm. or Vitorin um, or Simvastatin. Those are the four statins. Mm -hmm. And also the dose, mm -hmm. you know, you may not tolerate 20 milligrams of Cresto, but there's a five milligram tablet. And, and you may not tolerate it every day, but you can take it twice a week. So, you know, right. there, 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 there's not but a... So that's, that's with the, um, the cholesterol tablets, but not with the blood pressure tablets. You've got to take blood pressure tablets every day. I, I would say you should be taking, if we have diagnosed you with high blood pressure, mm -hmm. you should take your blood pressure tablets every day. Mm -hmm. um, we are saying more and more now that um, maybe you should take them at night mm -hmm. um, because the blood pressure for, well, for various reasons, the early morning hours, mm -hmm. the blood pressure begins to rise. And that's because um, your body's preparing yourself for the activities of the day. Mm -hmm. Adrenaline levels go up, cortisol levels go up, um, epinephrine levels go up. And, and, and that's why people tend to have heart attacks and strokes at 3, 4 in the morning. So the typical thing patients will tell me is that, Doc, my blood pressure was 120 over 80 today, so I didn't take my blood pressure tablet. Yeah. Big mistake. But you can then stagger the cholesterol ones. In some patients, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I mean, I, I very often I tell my patients if their cholesterol levels come down, um, that they can um, go to every other day or, okay. or, or three times a week. And a lot of patients are very happy about that because... Okay. Well, we're going to our second break now. Uh, when we come back, we'll be looking at some of the microvascular complications of diabetes. Remember, it's um, we're commemorating World Diabetes Day on November the 14th, and we're dedicating this program to Dawn, a uh, friend of ours who passed recently. Hi, I'm Reverend Valerie Ramkalawan from the Christ of Pro Revival Tabernacle. You can tune on every first and last Wednesday of the month on ACT and The Voice. And I'm there, 10.30 p.m. 15 minutes, you can tune on and you can be filled with the word of the Lord. Come on and be a part of this station. In Jesus' name, God bless you.
Good evening, Trenda Bego. Welcome to another edition of Scoreboard here on ACT. And it's always a pleasure to be in your company every Tuesday evening between the hours of 8 and 9. Welcome to the new season of Football 101. I am your host, Joshua DeMatos. Well, it's time for your weekly football news update. Hello, me, Messi. Unfortunately, Max. Hey, kiss, kiss the badge, kiss no. the badge. Oh, oh. What's that? Welcome to this edition of the interview. And as you can see, I'm not alone on the set. I have Marcus, a Liverpool fan, and I have Shakira. Okay, so welcome back to the final part of our program, well, uh, Your Health, Your Choice. We're looking at the complications of diabetes. Uh, we're celebrating World Health, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, World Diabetes World Day. Diabetes Day. Um, Dr. Khan is wearing his World Diabetes Day pin in commemoration. It's 14th of November. Um, so we've looked at macrovascular complications of diabetes. We've looked at the whole issue of how it affects women. Um, and now we're looking at yes. microvascular. Microvascular disease. So, so what is micro? So, macrovascular disease means that it's affecting the large vessels, mm -hmm. um, the coronary artery, the coronary arteries, the carotid arteries, and the um, femoral arteries. Microvascular disease affects the small arteries. So we start with the eyes, what we call diabetic retinopathy. And I want to show this diagram because it um, really. Uh, those white areas should not be, um, I should have had a diagram with a normal retina, um, but what you're seeing here blotches. is um, blotches. Yeah. Those are exudates, the white areas, and you can see some red spots. Those are hemorrhages, um, dot and blot hemorrhages. Um, and we, we start with what is called background retinopathy, where there the, are the, the less than five of those um, very fluffy areas, what are called cotton wool spots, um, and the veins begin to dilate. Now, that's background retinopathy. What is the hard um, exudate? What the hard that? exudates are protein exudates. That's not so troublesome, mm -hmm. but the white fluffy areas, you notice there's a difference, right? Mm -hmm. The white fluffy areas are of concern because that, those are areas, ischemic areas, mm -hmm. that, the, that, that that area of the retina is not receiving a sufficient blood supply. This again is background retinopathy. Mm -hmm. um, now it, 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 it uh, progresses to what we call pre-proliferative mm -hmm. retinopathy where you have more cut and wool spots, you have multiple hemorrhages, mm -hmm. okay? And then you have, look at this, proliferative retinopathy. So and it comes from the word prolific, which means right. there's a lot of There's it. a lot. Now, mm -hmm. the white areas you're seeing there, I just want to explain, this patient probably had laser therapy, mm -hmm. and those are scar uh, scars, but they're meant to stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm. And then we have, again, proliferative retinopathy. And now this is the big, big, big problem. If you don't treat retinopathy, you get massive bleeding, mm -hmm. vitreous bleeding. And I'd, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then that uh, uh, results in re retinal detachment, etc. Mm -hmm. So a diabetic so we can, eye disease then. Yes. So now, generally, you would not expect someone with one year of diabetes to have diabetic eye disease. Mm -hmm. Yet, there are patients who come in to me and um, they've been referred from the ophthalmologist mm -hmm. and they've gone for a routine eye check and what happens is that um, the, the, the um, ophthalmologist picks up these changes and uh, they suddenly find out they're diabetic, but in fact they've been diabetic for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. And now that comes as a big shock to some patients. So these changes that you're seeing, background retinopathy, um, if, if we can pick up people at that stage, so that's where screening for retinopathy is very important. Um, in the Southwest region, we are, we are fortunate to be 
in fact, the only region in, in health region in Trinidad that's doing retinal screening. Mm -hmm. um, and that was um, supposed to be um, ruled out to the rest of the country. But because of funding, we're having some issues with that. So what does retinal screening? It means that all diabetic patients, all type 2 diabetic patients from diagnosis should have either an examination by an ophthalmologist mm -hmm. or have a camera photograph at least, I would say, once every 18 months to two years. Okay. Right. So we're acting today to change tomorrow with uh, retinal yeah. screening. Screening. So, so if we pick up people at that stage, good blood pressure control, good blood sugar control, good lipid control can reverse some of those changes. But if you get to vitreous bleeding, that last diagram, I'm afraid you have to be referred to a retinal surgeon. We had Dr. Ronnie Bowler here um, with us. Um, there's, there are some other retinal Dr. surgeons. And, it's, yeah. and, and Linda, that is major surgery and very expensive. And, and you're not guaranteed to regain your sight. Unfortunately. Yeah, so we do need to do this early, early screening. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, we have 10 more minutes on the program. Is there anything so, else? Well, there are two other areas. Um, there's diabetic kidney disease, mm -hmm. um, diabetic nephropathy. And in diabetic nephropathy, um, you have the kidneys being affected. And there's stage 1 to 5, which is called chronic kidney disease. And what happens very, very slowly, your, your kidneys begin to be affected if your blood sugars are running at a high level. Um, but but uh, quickly, let me add, if, if you have diabetes plus hypertension mm -hmm. plus hyperlipidemia, you are more at risk of kidney disease. And this is why we are now, what, uh, you know, again, we screen for the eyes. Can we screen for nephropathy? Yes, okay. by doing a, a special urine test. Mm -hmm. It's urine for microalbuminuria. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a test, a simple urine test. We send to the lab and we pick up between 30 to 300 grams, milligrams, sorry, of um, protein in, in the urine. And that's not picked up on a normal dipstick. Mm -hmm. So um, all diabetic patients should have microalbuminuria testing. And I'm afraid a lot of our diabetic patients, well, we can't get it in a hospital setting. Um, and just to say, we are really having some major problems with um, getting access to um, basic be blood basic? testing, etc. Before the, oh, yes. No, I'm just saying, so, it, it's, it is difficult just for basic testing yes. diabetics right now in Trinidad and yes. Tobago. Yes. And, and again, if we can pick up nephropathy at an early stage, um, we can stabilize the kidneys and, and you know people can have a long productive life without needing dialysis mm -hmm. but but you have to treat it early you have to treat it aggressively um, and sometimes you have to have dietary changes etc okay um, I, I know that uh, depression is also connected with diabetes yes. Do you uh, expand on that a bit first? okay so so uh, depression is one of the hidden mm -hmm problems with diabetes. I think as healthcare professionals, we often take it for granted. You know, patients are going to stick their fingers, they're going to inject themselves two or three times a day, they're going to have to look at what they're eating every time they go out, can I have this snack? Can I? Most of us don't have to do that, Linda. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, yes, we should live healthily, mm -hmm. but uh, unfortunately, most of our diabetics are not being screened for depression. Mm -hmm. There's a depression screening score that you can do, mm -hmm. um, um, but that takes time. And in fact, one of the things we are meeting up with the powers that be in the Southwest is that we, we really make a push towards the multidisciplinary mm -hmm. approach to diabetes care, where we have a psychologist on board who can see some of these patients at an early stage. And uh, Dr. Nishtar, again, the um, Pakistani, um, female diabetologist, she was saying that women with type 2 diabetes are 10 times more likely to have uh, heart disease and have significantly increased risk of depression in comparison to men. Right. And um, she said, she, she was, what I, I also wanted to um, mention was the impact it has not just on the patient, but on the families of the patients. Yes. Um, and she, she, she looked at in Pakistan particularly, and she said, um, she used this particular case 
At 44 years, Remat is the youngest of four sisters, all of whom are obese. Um, so, and we said yes. that was a predisposition for diabetics. Recently, Remat was hospitalized for a diabetic foot amputation. And again, you know, we're saying that we could prevent these amputations if we act today to change mm. tomorrow. Um, a common and tragic outcome of un uncontrolled diabetes, which will place great difficulties and challenges for her ahead at such a young age. Two of her sisters are on dialysis due to end-stage diabetes-related renal disease. Mm -hmm. And already one sister has undergone a heart bypass operation unsuccessfully. All the sisters suffers from, suffer from serious damage to their eyes, another complication of diabetes. So the burden of care for the entire extended family in emotional, physical, and economic terms is devastating. And, um, you know, we have to consider the opportunity cost weighing heavily in terms of the well-being and future outlook um, of families. So it's, it's um, you know, we're saying act today to change yeah. tomorrow because the long-term effects of diabetes are, that are much more costly, mm. not just in material terms, but, in, you know, in, in, terms, in, yeah. in, in terms of yeah. family life and, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I don't know how much, how much more time we have. There was just one slide, one more slide on peripheral neuropathy. And, and Linda, if you look at this one, th this looks a little bit um, unappealing, but, but we see in our office these diabetic foot ulcers. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, th th what happens in, in um, uh, this last complication of microvascular disease is diabetic neuropathy. So that the feet become um, numb, you don't feel um, that you may have stepped on a sharp object. You know, we have Christmas holidays coming up, people might go to the beaches, they may um, not wear something on their feet, they can step on a sharp object. And the foot ulcer, the diabetic foot ulcer, typically develops just under the big toe. Um, that's the pressure point or under the heel. Um, the, the, the one on the right side is what is called Charcot's. Charcot's arthropathy. Now, mm -hmm. people um, don't often detect this until it's very late. And what happens in that case is that they have repeated trauma to the feet, the bones are fractured, the feet are numb, they don't have pain, and then they end up with deformed feet. And, and you know, that's a major problem. So um, we can come on that slide. Um, diabetic neuropathy um, is an is, uh, ongoing problem. Um, what we're trying to do is prevent amputations. And, and you know, we want to say that the powers to that be, we really need to make a, a push towards training podiatrists or at least training people who can have a basic ability to look at feet. Um, these are not doctors, but, but healthcare professionals who can highlight, look, uh, come into the doctor's room and say, Doc, I think you need to look at this patient's feet because we simply don't have the time to ask all our patients to it take up their success. It has to be a team issues. approach on yes. a professional level yes. as well. Yes. Yeah. And, um, so we have about three more minutes. You normally put your pastor's cap on. Well, I, I, I just want to remind people again, we showed the flyer earlier on um, for our diabetic seminar, which is coming up um, on Saturday, November the 11th. Um, I'm excited about this because um, I'm going to do one of the talks, but I probably won't have a lot of time because we have um, Reshmi Matur, who is an excellent, excellent um, optometrist. We have um, a podiatrist from St. Augustine coming down, um, Ms. Huntley. Um, we have a Nyker. Sanwa, Sanwa, who is mm -hmm. um, our diabetes educator, and of course we have a fitness expert, mm -hmm. um, France Jalizo. France Jalizo, mm -hmm. um, and he's going to come and talk a bit about fitness and um, the importance in diabetes. And I'll just be the icing on the cake, as it oh, were. Okay. Is that the right? Term? Yeah, yeah, you and, can. <laughs> I, I will just. So, so, if you're interested, not just my patients. If you're looking tonight, it's at number 12 Johnson Street, the Anaposis Chapel. It's very visible from the bypass. Um, and it's 4 to 6 p.m. next week, Saturday, 11th, ring on 482-4269. I think we have one minute left, left as I put on my pastor's hat. Mm -hmm. um, we have been preaching a series of messages at our church, um, the Anaposis Center on grace. Mm -hmm. We have talked about liberating grace. We have talked about healing grace. We have talked about saving grace. And last week, I, I challenged our church to, 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 to share or to offer grace to one another. And, and one of the things I, I made the point is that if we have unforgiveness in our heart, and in fact, there's a verse in Proverbs that talks about unforgiveness actually shortening your life. So here we are 
talking about diabetes, Linda, and all the complications, but actually unforgiveness can also shorten your life. And there's a verse in Hebrews that says, do not miss the grace of God and allow a root of bitterness to take place in your life or to take root Roots. in your life. Mm -hmm. So I want to challenge you today. Unforgiveness does not mean that you become best friends with the person who has hurt you. Doesn't mean that that person actually comes back into your inner circle. Forgiveness is what you do towards that person. It's up to that person whether they accept the forgiveness or not. So if you don't have a home church, the Anaposis Chapel, Sunday mornings, 9 a.m., good place to be. Over to you, Linda. Okay, so uh, once again, we want to thank you for uh, commemorating World Diabetes Day on the 14th of November with that seminar and also with just general lifestyle practices and uh, general education. This is what this program is about. Your health is, is your choice, but we try to um, reach communities with other programs as well. Um, so once again, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you in a fortnight's time with another program, Your Health, Your Choice. The preceding program is in no way intended to replace your doctor's advice or treatment program, nor should it be used as a tool for the purpose of self-diagnosis.